Roland. Welcome, Roland. So just to fill in a little bit about Roland. Now, this is an example of um, one of the benefits of, of having webinars like this. So um, Roland, there's, there's a guy by the name of uh, Papa Douglas here in Johannesburg. And Papa Douglas actually uh, works with Roland and works in, with Roland at developing his football program in South Africa. And he got onto our webinars uh, about six weeks ago. And he started talking to me, communicating with me, and told me about his program and told me that he's um, got somebody that would like to speak to us with huge amounts of knowledge in various aspects of, of sport. And um, it's actually great, it's a privilege to, to get somebody like uh, Roland to come and talk to us. So I'd like to thank uh, Papa Douglas and I'd like to thank Roland for, for being here and joining us. Right, okay, great. Um, Sean, it's great really to be on your program this morning. Uh, it was good to, to listen to your to your last guest, and um, you know, as as a coach and an educator, you know, you don't know everything. You have to learn all the time. So I try to listen to as many people as as possible, get a different perspective. Um, and sometimes you don't always have to agree with what someone is saying, but you must always give them the courtesy of listening. Um, you may learn something. So you know, listening in this morning, I was very very pleased. To it's a great pleasure, really, to be on your program this morning. Thank you. And that, that is very important, is that nobody knows everything, and you can always learn. And now you've come up with your book, which will actually help quite a bit the, the people that, that CBCS has been talking about in structuring and de designing and developing their, their football programs. Um, and, it, and, it, and yours is through huge amounts of research from various different coaches, um, talking to various different people, and we'll go through that all in your in your presentation. But um, it, it's actually it's it's great. You can never learn too much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you should really not just as a coach, but as a human being, you should you should be very much like a sponge. Really, you want to soak everything up. Um, sometimes you have to filter certain things out, but you know you must have a very open mind. You know, don't have a closed mind because you will never learn having a closed mind. So it's so, so important to have a very open mind. Listen to different perspectives because you may discover something that you didn't actually think of. And that will be very helpful in your development. So really right throughout your life, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to learn, you're trying to improve. And then obviously you're looking to pass that knowledge on. Because knowledge is to be passed on, it's to be shared, it's not to be kept for yourself. Um, I do have difficulty in people who try to get knowledge purely for themselves. I believe knowledge has to be shared and there's some very good examples um, around the world in terms of people who share knowledge. Um, you know, I, the Australians, I love the Australians for that because, you know, they want to share whatever they know and uh, for me that is something fantastic. You don't just keep it to yourself, believing that you have a little secret. There's no such thing as a little secret. Um, it just means that somebody hasn't found it out yet. And the Australians, you know, they believe very much in sharing knowledge, uh, very much at the forefront of um, development when it comes to sport and, and technology. And, you know, I, I follow them very, very closely. And you know, I'm in contact with quite a, a lot of them um, in different spheres. Uh, really, they're very, very helpful. And, you know, I try really to pass on what I learn from them um, to people who come into contact with me, myself. So for, for everybody listening in, if I needed to, if I started telling you all about Roland and two years and what he's done, you'd think that we're actually talking about, um, this is actually a cricket webinar, not a football webinar. I mean, Roland's, Roland's history, Roland's story is absolutely massive in the crickets, cricketing space, having played cricket for, for England, um, had a huge international cricketing career, been on various boards, various councils, coached various teams around the world with cricket. But I listened to a webinar. Um, it was actually an interview with Roland talking about his book. And the whole Roland's cricket story starts off with him playing football with mates of his in the UK where a team next door to a, t a team that was coming on to play cricket after them, were, they were missing a player. And they asked Roland to join them to play cricket. So truthfully, his football stories his story starts off with football before it goes into cricket now it's nice to see it going back into football again am i yeah. correct roland mm. yes yes um it's a a very very um strange situation and um 
I guess it brings us on to um, who we are, uh, which is uh, obviously part of, of my presentation, who we are. Um, yes, uh, for those of people who don't know me, yeah, my name is Roland Butcher, yeah. I was born in Barbados, um, a very, very small place, um, some 166 square miles. So it's not a, a, a huge place, very small island in the Caribbean. Um, I was born on the eastern tip of Barbados um, in a place called St. Philip, um, very rural parish. So, you know, it's considered in those days when I was a youngster, it was considered to be um, in the backwater, really, because Bridgetown, the capital, was probably about 15 miles away. And in those days, transportation would have been extremely difficult from that area. So it's a place where you really had limited opportunities. And coming from the area, really the only two things available for youngsters, you either had to try to play cricket or you had to play or track and field. Those were the only two options available to you. Um, for some reason, as a very young boy, I got very interested in cricket. But I guess the reason for that is that Barbados and the Caribbean has a rich history and culture um, in cricket and success, and really have produced some of the greatest players the world has ever seen. Even from this very small island here, uh, we've probably produced more um, players who have got SIRs behind their names than perhaps any other country in the world. So growing up, you know, these, these guys were real world models um, as a youngster, five, six, seven years. The interesting thing for me really was that um, my real hero as a youngster was, was actually a South African. Um, you know, I idolize um, Colin Bland as, as a cricketer. Um, I had never seen him play, but what I read about him, it, it made me re it made an impression on me because I didn't want it to be like him in every way. Um, so one of the things we did as youngsters was to do a lot of reading in those days. And when someone in the village got hold of a sports book or, or, or magazine, once he's read it, he would pass it around. So eventually it got to me and I was reading about the fantastic feats of, of Colin Bland picking the ball up and throwing it from all angles and hitting the stumps. And, and when he did the exhibition at Lord's and um, hit the stumps, six out of six times um, in an exhibition. And so I got really excited um, about that. And I guess also I was very fortunate to have um, some people like Sir Charles Griffith and Seymour Nurse who were sports council coaches um, in Barbados come into our primary schools uh, maybe once a month. So to have a grounding um, from those two was, was important. I was by no means the best player at that stage in my age group. There's no question about that. I was just a player who really liked to play the game. So I stayed in Barbados until I was 13 and a half. Limited opportunities, obviously, to play cricket simply because of the area that I lived. But I went to England um, when I was 13 and a half. Um, my parents decided it was time for me to, to come to England. Who had they'd been there since the 50s. So I went to England and while I was in England, obviously everything was different because in cricket, in Barbados, we played cricket all the time. Wherever you went, you saw cricket. Now, I arrived in England and it was the complete opposite. It was football everywhere and very little cricket. So, you know, naturally kids are very adaptable. So I actually got involved playing football and really football took over my life and I, I, I did very little in relation to cricket. And Getting back into cricket was really through, as you said, um, an experience playing football. My normal weekends um, with friends was to go to the local park and play some informal football. And I, I think informal football what I will say, informal football is just so, so important for the development of young players. Um, I know there is a rush uh, for people to get all the players into 
um, various academies, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, once they're in the academy, then they need to play in formal football because that's where you experiment. That's where you learn the skills. That's where they try things. That's where, um, you know, nobody holds you for making a mistake. You know, so it's so, so important. So we, that's what we did on Sundays and Saturdays. Local park, create some goals, and, and we just played, just played our hearts out. And there was one particular um, Sunday, uh, we just finished packing up to go home, and obviously the fields are multi-purpose. So they, they use for cricket, they use for football. And some guys came onto the field, put up some stunts, and wandered over to our group and said, listen, you guys, we, we, we've got a cricket game going on here, but um, we're short of players. Would you guys be interested in, in playing? And the natural reaction was, of course not. I mean, we just played for three hours football, wanted to get home. Also, in those days, you had um, professional football shown on the TV in the afternoon, so you, that would be your afternoon. But one of my friends who was very close to me, uh, and obviously we had discussed my background coming from the Caribbean, cricket, etc., and he, he said, you like cricket, why don't you play? And obviously I was very, very reticent to do that. But he actually persuaded me to play. Um, so I, I went home, I got a shirt, came back, played. Didn't do anything fantastic. I think I took a couple of catches, got a few runs. But it probably impressed him enough to say, listen, um, this guy probably has something. Let's invite him back next week. And this was the third 11 for my local town, uh, Paul Stevenage. So uh, I got, I really got back into cricket that way, um, through the football. And obviously developed from there, played for my local county schools. I went to MCC as a young professional. Then I spent 20 years at Lords for Middlesex. Played for England, uh, you know, played for Barbados, Tasmania, et cetera, et cetera. So my background was an international cricketer, but you're absolutely right. You know, football really has been a, a very integral part of my life as well, because while I was a professional footballer, while I was a professional cricketer, I also played semi-professional football. In the early years of my um, cricketing uh, profession, in those days in England, you, you really played from April till September. And after September, uh, really, in those days, there was not a lot of travel. So I played football in, in the winter. So I played semi-professionally in, in, in the winter. Then I went back to cricket in the, in the summer. Obviously, later on, that became rather complicated because other, other countries opened up for cricket in the winters. So then, you know, you travel 12 months a year and it became more difficult. But I continued... While I was in England, I continued to play. And at the same time, I also decided, you know, that I would take my coaching qualifications as well. I spent 10 years at Arsenal Football Club as a soccer school coach. And, you know, that really was a good education and, and, and a good grounding. And, and it helped me also in my cricket to see, you know, how, how another sport does things. So... That time spent there was, was very, very good. I also, um, later on in my career, as I was coming towards the end of my sporting career, and it was a long one. Um, I was played for 20 years as a, as a professional. And I really, I've had a passion about football for so long that I wanted to take it even further. And I then decided that I would take my UA for B license course course and that was a course over three months um, very intense but met some great people enjoyed it immensely it was well on that course that I, I met a young man by the name of Brendan Rogers and any football fan would know that Brendan Rogers is currently the manager of Leicester City uh, ex Liverpool ex Celtic and we met on the course. He was doing, the, he was doing his UFB the same time as myself. So we met, got on really well. Um, he had played for Ireland under 21. 
had a number of injuries and decided very early that, you know, coaching is something he wanted to get into because obviously the injury side was causing him a problem. So we got on well um, throughout that course. Course finished, we went our separate ways. And sometime later, I received an unexpected phone call from Brendan Rogers. And um, he told me that he had just been appointed academy director at Reading Football Club and he would like me to come and work with him. So, you know, it, it really was um, out of the blue. Um, I must have left some sort of impression on him on the course. And I said, yes, I agreed. And I went to, to Reading Football Club and worked under him as an academy coach. Um, while he was there, obviously he was doing very well. Um, he attracted the attention of one Jose Mourinho who was at Chelsea, who persuaded him um, to come to Chelsea. So Brendan went to Chelsea. I stayed at Reading for a little while, then I really drifted back into cricket. I went to Bermuda's national coach, um, was away for a little while. But eventually, you know, I, I, I came back to England, um, did some more football, and then in 2004, I got the opportunity um, to be asked to come back to Barbados, that's the place of my birth, um, to be director of sports at the University of West Indies. Um, that was going to be a challenge because the Caribbean is a place where sport, quite often they mix sport at sport. Um, they don't really understand um, the, the value of, of sport and it was always going to be a challenge. The university didn't have a sports program at all. Um, the sports they had was run by this, the students. So my job really was to create uh, a more professional sports program, develop the sports facilities, etc., etc. But as director of sports, it was not just one sport. So I actually ended up developing 15 sports um, at, the, at the university, and three of those sports have world-class facilities. When I retired last year, after 15 years, um, fant got a fantastic foot cricket um, set up, ground and pavilion, etc. Football field, state-of-the-art, um, also running track as well. And, and the university, really since 2006, has completely dominated um, sport right throughout. Um, Barbados in, in all sports and really one of the other things that we did also because the University of West Indies is made up of um, three main campuses one in Barbados one in Trinidad one in Jamaica and then the open campuses which serve the the other islands and the university is really funded by 17 of the Caribbean countries uh, I then had to look more on a, a, a regional basis so you know, I, I was able to create a, a combined campuses and college cricket team, which plays actually in our first class competition in the Caribbean. Uh, and they have won that competition. So, you know, that's something that I am very proud of. And I and started to do the same thing with football. And with football, you know, we were able to sign MOUs between the university and CONCACAF. And just before I left, we also signed an MOU with the Argentine Football Association and University to help the development um, of football. Um, during that period, I spent some time at um, Boca Juniors in Argentina. I got the opportunity to go to Boca Juniors, a really an amazing club, um, absolutely amazing. I mean, for those who really follow football closely, they would know Carlos Tevez. Tevez was. Um, very much homegrown at Boca Juniors. And um, really it was at the end um, of my cricketing, at the end of my career with the university, um, that I finally decided that I needed to complete a project that I had started some time ago, which was um, the football manual. So I spent um, that last year getting this manual um, in place because for me the manual is just so important because Barbados 
I see the similarities between Barbados and, and South Africa in that the talent is unquestionable in the Caribbean and in South Africa. The talent is there. And really one of the things that we have missing um, in the, both of these regions is, and your last speaker spoke about it, was that, you know, we, we don't like coming out of our comfort zone. You know, so, so somebody, it, it, you know, the, the idea of being a big fish in a, a big fish in a small pool appeals greatly to them. Same thing here in the Caribbean, the football. You know, somebody would want to be the local star than to be the international star. You know, football is, is I mean, is the number one sport in the Caribbean in terms of participation. There's no question about that. While the history and culture is cricket and success and the West Indies is known because of cricket, football is the number one in terms of support and playing. But I have seen over time that there is no organization in terms of coaching, um, no structure, etc., etc. So I really set out to deliver um, a product really to try and awaken the consciousness of this football craze because it is a football craze. Um, to try and move these players from being spectators who watch the television and marvel at Messi and all of these great players. Why can't Caribbean players be on that same stage? So with this in mind, I really set out a coaching manual that with structure that would assist these coaches throughout their development. And what's really important about this um, manual is that the manual works specifically with various age groups. So it deals with five to seven age groups, how the coaches really need to work with those guys, what they need to teach, how, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Seven to nine, nine to 11, 11 to 13, 13 to adults. And it's, it, it really is a, is a, it's a comprehensive um, program. Each, each one of those age groups comes with a 10 week program. And the program is structured in such a way that it always has long-term player development in mind. So you're moving um, forward all the time so that there's, there is a development process um, to what you're doing. Too often in our region, coaches come and do what they feel like doing on the day. It has no um, specific thing for what they've done before. And that really creates a lot of problems in the development of the player because he, he does, he, there's gaps in his development and, and consequently he's unable to make it to the top. So really that's what I set up to do with this manual. And really there's a methodology there that um, can really assist um, people moving forward. Now, as I said, so that, that, that's a little bit about who I am. Um, so now I can go into your presentation as to who you, what you're doing here in South Africa. Right, yeah, well, what I'm doing today, yeah. Okay, and the influence, the influences. So basically, basically, what I, what I was, was saying there, and, and coaches, all coaches have a story, right? The, you know, it doesn't matter what level you're at, there is a story. And that, who we are, really applies to, to all of those coaches. And, okay, if we, if we have a look now at the influences, now, before you become a coach, you are influenced by many, many things, you know. So myself, no different, you know. I was hugely influenced um, by um, my, my, my grandmother and my aunt. And, and the reason for that is that my parents went to England in the early 50s. I stayed in Barbados with my parents, with my, with my grandparents, and they had a huge influence on me because there were no actual, there were no males in the house, so there was just females. So, the, so there was a female influence on me which helped me to develop to where I got to today. So that's one of the influences that assisted me. I'm sure that other people 
they will, they will have similar backgrounds. Um, at school, you know, your PE teacher uh, was someone, you know, who perhaps influenced you, took an interest in you. Other sports, um, you know, certainly can influence you. The performances, what other sports do um, in their sport, that can be an influencer. Um, individual players, you know, the, the quality of the skill that those players um, exhibit can also be an influencer. Events, uh, like here, the, you know, you see the Mexico 86 um, World Cup, you know, great influencer on myself and other people. And down at the bottom there, you see Arsene Wenger. Now, Arsene Wenger was at Arsenal while I was there, so I had the opportunity to observe um, how he went about things. So he, he, was a, he was a great influencer, not just on me, but I mean, his impact on a club like Arsenal was, was just unbelievable because here was this guy who he came from Japan. He was recruited from Grampus 8 in Japan. Comes to Arsenal uh, with no great record, but has a different philosophy to any of the other coaches that, or managers that's ever been at the club. He suddenly has, his thinking now is about the type of food that people eat, the type of training, you know. And when Arsenal, when Arsenal moved from Highbury, just around the corner to the Emirates, you know, Arsene Wenger designed the stadium right down to the dressing room. And the dressing room, if you go to Arsenal Football Club and you go into their dressing room, their dressing room is, is almost like a, a, it's almost like a half circle. And he was using his Japanese influence. Again, he was influenced by the Japanese. That no plate, no, no plate that you should not be backing any player. So he designed um, the dressing rooms at Arsenal Football Club so that when he is speaking, he's facing all the players in this half circle position. So great influence, so certainly for me to be able to see that. But the influence that he's had on those players and the club, that's why he's so revered. Um, at Arsenal, even though long, even though he's gone now, even the players, the great players who came there and left, you know, they revere what he's done because he was a great influencer. So influences for all of us are, are very, very important, and they really make up um, who, who, who we are. Uh, right, Sean. Let's have a look at the in terms of influences. Um, I think one of the influences, the latest influencer for me um, at this point in time is, as you said, you know, Papa Douglas Silvani from the Medlangu Foundation, really, as I was developing my, my, my book, I'm trying to think actually how we actually got involved, but, um, you know, what he was trying to do was became very important to me. and. Um, so as a result of, of the excellent work being done by the Midland Youth Foundation, you know, I formed a partnership with Midland Youth Foundation and University of the West Indies. Uh, Midland Youth's role is to create a conducive platform for South Africa coaches to share and gain more insight in my coaching methodology, learn and adapt, adopt best practices. Furthermore, the partnership will broaden the horizons of underprivileged kids coming from poor and disadvantaged backgrounds. Scholarships and exchange programs will offer kids opportunities which are hard to come by. Mentalangu seeks to establish a center of excellence where kids will train, get educated, 
and be prepared for their professional adult life. Kids will be housed in a boarding school setup. The coaching network will provide SEDEC coaches an opportunity to network and improve their technical knowledge. We'll offer sports education to kids who do not make it as professional players. The Center of Excellence will offer the following sports as well. They will offer soccer, netball, and cricket. So, as I said, influencers. So, it, my latest influencer really is Midlangu Foundation, who, by the great work that they're doing, um, it really is aligning with my thinking and my methodology. And I'm really looking forward to um, taking that partnership as far as possible because I think what they're doing is fantastic and I'm sure that we can go um, a lot further. I think also at this point, I would like to take this opportunity to invite more coaches to join our coaches group. There is a coaches group in South Africa right now created. We, we meet on a weekly basis. Again, Papa Douglas is the key man there. Um, more coaches, if you're listening out there, I think get on board, join this group, and let us try and move South Africa football forward. Sean, we'll now get into the her presentation. And the presentation today really is about, as coaches, you know, how do we model and watch the game? Context, basically, remember always, um, when, when we're doing this, always keep in mind the long-term development. Long-term de player development. Always keep that in mind as coaches when, you, you know, when you're modeling and watching the game. Okay, let's have a look at the context in terms of, from a coaching point of view, there are three areas uh, as a coach that you need to concentrate on as you watch the game. You cannot watch the game like a spectator. Um, spectators, um, as you can see, in a big crowd, spectators, what they do is they, they, they follow the ball. Wherever the ball goes, the spectator, that's where his attention is, wherever the ball goes. Now, as a coach, that's not what you're supposed to do. You have three specific areas as a coach for watching. Right. So while you're watching, you watch on the ball. So the player on the ball, if it is your player, you're looking to see the decisions that he makes. Are there right decisions? Are there wrong decisions? Were there other um, decisions to be made? What options did he have? Did he execute those options um, well? Um, did he not execute those options? Did he see the options available, um, available to him? So on the ball, so you isolate that area to start with on the ball. Now, you also must view the game from around the ball, right? As well as in the final third. So around the ball, basically you're looking what is happening around the ball with your players. Is your player uh, moving in the right direction? Is he too far left? Is he too far right? Should he be more uh, closer to the player. So, you, so you're looking to see what is actually happening around the ball with your players. You're also looking to see what is happening around the ball with the opposition. In that situation, how has the operate, what has the opposition done? Um, the players around the ball. And so, so be very, very specific as you watch around the ball to see um, what these players are doing. And the other area that a coach must have is away from the ball. So again, as we said, he's not a spectator. So he gets the, the whole picture. He has to know, put everything into perspective and watch 
away from the ball. What is happening away from the ball? Um, is my centre forward coming back too far? Is he staying up? What is happening with my left back? What's happening with my centre back? What's happening with my centre midfield? What's happening with my centre back? So he's looking at the whole picture. So these are the three areas that we really need to, to hone in on as coaches. Um, you know, I myself, as a, I'm a football fan as well as a coach. So there's always, um, you know, I'm always wanting to enjoy the game also as a fan. But while watching, it, it, it kicks into my mind, you know, that I have to watch this game more critically than the, than the, the fan because I am looking for improvement and I'm looking for results. So I cannot enjoy the game um, like, like a fan. And really, so it's very, very important that you take your viewing of, of your training sessions and also the viewing of your matches and isolate these areas um, in, what, in what you look for. Right, in terms of long-term player um, development, um, there really, there are five um, core themes to long-term player development. And really, there was a technical, the social, tactical, the physical and psychological. So those really are the five core themes um, for long-term player development. Remember, as I said, as a coach, that is what you need to concentrate on, the long-term player development. It is not now, it is not yesterday, it is not tomorrow, it is all of those things. So. You're looking really at moving the player all the way through. So in terms of technical, in technical, obviously, you're looking at position specific. You're looking at pass selection. You know, are they making the, are they making the right passes? You know, these, these are all technical functions. Um, in a situation, what is the correct pass? for that situation. And all of these things are to be replicated um, in training. So it's, you know, it's, it's a technical function. Shot selection um, in this position, should he have shot along the ground? Or can he, or, or, or he's going for a shot in the air. So the so shot selection is something that you work on in particular situations. Uh, receiving skills. Um, you know, player must be able to receive the ball both on the ground and in the air. So those are practice skills, they're technical skills um, that have to be taught and they are a core um, theme in, in the development. Receiving on the pressure, you know, player must be able to get the ball on the pressure, um, retain control on the pressure. He doesn't learn that by sitting at home. It's a technical skill that has to be taught, receiving under pressure. Defending 1v1, All right, matched up and outnumbered. Again, these are things that need to be practiced. Um, will occur in games, but it has to be practiced as a technical skill. Uh, traveling with the ball and without the ball. So again, those don't just happen by themselves technical skill to be to be practiced. Now let's have a look also social. Now the so social the things that come under that player center dependent really on personality trait is the person um, yeah. is he an introvert? Is he an extrovert? You know you will have both of those players um, in your team. Very, very rarely you have a team where the entire team is either introvert or the entire team is extrovert. Um, one will either be introvert and the other will be an extrovert. 
social skills, you have to deal with that. Um, preferred communication method. Um, there are many communication methods within your team and as a coach, um, some verbal, some nonverbal. So really, the, the finding out what the preferred communication method is very, very important. Also, you and as players and coaches will have a preferred learning style. Um, everybody has a preferred learning style. Um, task specific. Leadership skills um, within the team, also yourselves as a coach, has to be has to be taught. Right. The encouragement of having the ability to challenge and ask questions. Um, you know, your players need to be able to, to challenge what you are telling them and ask questions. Uh, there's not a situation where you as coach, you know everything. Um, you, you know, that way you will not get the respect of the players. So you really encourage your players, you know, to challenge you. Um, and to ask questions. That would also make you a better coach um, once they're challenging you and ask questions. Um, get the, obviously the ability to reflect and evaluate performance. Um, you have to do that as well as your players. Um, extremely important because that helps you um, when you reflect and evaluate performance. That helps you to plan um, for the next session or the next game and the ability to assess the game and convey messages to teammates, right? Very, very important for you and for your players, that ability um, to assess the game and convey messages to the teammates. So these are the social skills within the long-term player development that really needs to be honed in on. Um, on the tactical side, um, position specific, obviously, extremely important you know because tactically you know you, you have to be strong tactically as well um, the formation specific possession specific out of possession specific and then that transition period that transition specific and also obviously the opposition specific because the opposition plays an important part in any game as well um, and tactically, game understanding, your players must have game understanding as well as yourself and, and of course, game craft. On the physical side, you know, position specific, um, individual specific, the scenario specific and the game specific. So, you know, Physically, obviously, position the player is playing in, um, so you you know you, you can train him physically for that position. Um, that's that's very much the case these days um, in terms of training. It's very much not like the old days where um, one hat fits everyone, where the whole team trains together. You'll find these days. Um, Training is done by parmentalizing the team. So you might have the defenders um, training together, midfielders training together, together forwards um, training, training together. Um, so position specific now, particularly physically, is very, very important. Um, individual specific, so the individual, um, you know, the role that he has to play. Um, you know, you will not train a center back like you would train a wing back because the two individual specific positions, center back doesn't have to do a lot of running. Um, he, has, he, he has a lot of game intelligence, positioning, reading in the game. So his training physically has to be different to someone like a wing back who has to be up and down, um, you know, running over maybe 20 meters at any one time, the center back moves maybe 10 meters at max um, in any direction. So position specific, individual specific, scenario specific, obviously this, this the situation, um, the scenario in, and obviously the game, game specific. 
In terms of psychological, um, these are areas really that you need to work very hard on to ensure that they instill really in the players because you're looking for the overall development commitment, you know, which is extremely important, important, you know. You have to be committed to what you're doing and, and the players also have to be committed um, to the team, to the methodology, um, to the vision, to the values, to all the things that you have um, within your team. Commitment is, is important, right? From a um, psychological perspective, control. Um, you know, you have to control yourself in, in, in certain um, situations where you must control yourself all the time, really, because control is extremely important. Um, if you lose control quite often, you know, you, you can lose the game because of losing control. And that can be said for the coach as well. You know, if you lose control um, on the bench, you know, basically you can lose control on the field because of, of you losing that control. Concentration, um, absolutely paramount. Um, as, a, as a psychological tool and um, confidence, you know, that self-belief that, yes, I can do this, um, I can achieve this, so have the confidence. Um, communication, obviously extremely important. You know, as human beings, we have to communicate um, with each other, so communication really is extremely important. And of course, uh, problem-solving skills, which is, um, you know, you're asking players, you have to, football is about solving problems. And really, the individual player, the individual player always has a problem um, to solve. And the better he's at solving that problem, um, the more success he will have and the team will have. So that's very important. So those five areas um, are very, very important for long-term player development. And as I said, as coaches, you know, we should be primarily concerned with the long-term development of our players. It is not just about winning um, this competition here now. It's about developing that player down the line. So long-term player development, very, very important. Just a quick recap uh, before I get to any questions will be obviously those five areas, technical, social, tactical, physical, and psychological really are the five core themes uh, for long-term player development. So at that point, um, I think, Sean, we can look to see any questions um, from anyone who, who has a question. And I'm sure, Sean, you've got a few yourself. I definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question that came from one of the coaches was that how does changes in weather affect players traveling to various countries from amateur to professional level? That's um, a very, very good question. And yes, there is, um, there is a huge change. There's no question about that. I think the player really has to um, mentally be very, very determined in, in really what his end goal is, what he wants to achieve, and really set out to achieve that end goal. Um, he must understand that before he gets to that end goal that there are gonna be some real challenges um, in that period. Um, your last caller spoke of, your last um, speaker spoke about, um, so I'm not sure if I'm getting it right, but is it Subisio? Subisio, yeah. Subisio, yeah. Um, basically, you know, he said, obviously being a professional is not as glamorous as people make it up to be. And he's absolutely right, because what people don't see is things like what you just said, where you have to transition from a warm country into a freezing cold country, you know, and you have to be very, you have to be mentally tough. Um, I myself had to make that transition because Barbados is sunshine 365 days in a year. I went to England, where you have maybe 65 days of the year, sunshine, the other 300, absolutely freezing. And, you know, it, it does take um, 
quite a quite a bit of getting used to. But I think what is important and what we need to understand in the Caribbean and in Africa and other places is that when we are sending players overseas, that we must try and make links um, within those countries of persons from Earth, from our regions, um, who would have gone to those areas and adopted, adapted um, to the environment. So we must make contact with those people. So when we send the players, that they have someone there who will actually um, be interested in them and also who have gone through what they're going through and can really keep them focused and confident. Um, a lot of the time in the Caribbean has made the mistakes of sending players overseas. They've sent them the wrong time of the year where it's cold. They haven't got anybody on the ground um, who can look after them. And invariably what will happen if the player is not uh, really motivated um, internally or, or mentally strong, uh, he will find the environment just too harsh for him. And quite often, um, he will give up and, and fail. And quite often, it's not his fault. It is because we have not taken the necessary steps to help him to adapt to that new environment. Um, this is a question that came up earlier on with Neil Toby, and it was asked by uh, an ex-professional uh, player here in South Africa who's now coaching football at one of our schools. And he asked, uh, what has it taken kids going to school, going from school to universities to pursue an education and play varsity football at 18 years old and play for about two, three or four years instead of going straight to a club where they'll only focus on football? So it's more the holistic pro approach because you, you can even go to one of the clubs and still get a university degree. But the holistic approach in, in coaching a kid when he goes to the, the post-school, like university kind of level. Yes, the, I think the educational part is um, extremely important. Um, the last 15 years of my work in life, uh, is, is, that's exactly what I was doing. Um, having come to the University of the West Indies and set up the sports program, uh, then what I had to do after that was, we then offered um, sports scholarships. So I scoured the Caribbean for talented footballers, talented cricketers, talented basketball players, netball, track and field, and brought them to the university um, on a sports scholarship. So basically, they were excellent at sport and they were excellent at academics, because academically, obviously, they had to be right to get into the university. But what was important was that they didn't have to separate the two at university. They were able to do both and it's just a case of actually balancing the time. And I think what you will end up with is a much more rounded individual um, when that happens. So I think it's, it's to be encouraged. Um, you know, if players can get into that environment where they can do the sport and the education, I think they have a win-win situation. And um, that's very, very important and should be encouraged. Now, with, with your project that you've got here in South Africa with Papa Douglas, um, can you tell us a bit more about the specific side with the educational side? Because it's also linked to the university, isn't it? So there's more than just a, a playing of football. There's the educational side here plus a future university side. Yes, I mean, the, the, obviously the, the link um, with the university is very, very important because from the perspective that I just said, because universities primarily are about education, but, you know, they're, they're slowly learning that education and sport. Are, are vital components of the development. So really this partnership will, you know, will work to the benefit of, of individuals in terms of, of scholarships and exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the university will play a, a really an important role um, in this whole exercise. And really it now creates an opportunity for a person who perhaps um, didn't see this opportunity um, so the university's got a, an, an important role to, to play, and um, this really is an extension of what I was doing really for the last 15 years, was, you know, creating um, a situation where, you know, persons would come into the university on exchange uh, programs, etc., etc. So, you know, this is no different to that, 
in that. Obviously, you know, we're now looking to give kids um, who really come from challenging backgrounds that opportunity really to become the best that they can be in their lives. Um, Tulani has asked a question specifically on your long-term player development model. What is the process and duration of each of these five aspects? Right, well, it's an ongoing thing. Um, you know, it is just done at, obviously at different levels. Now, all of these things really have to be taught, I think, from the very beginning. You know, I got back to the grassroots level. Um, really, the grassroots is the foundation of any um, football nation. You know, if, if, if you've got a good thriving grassroots, you will find that your international side also it, it, it is a very strong, strong side. Now, when there's a disconnect between the grassroots and the top, uh, that's where you have the problem. So the grassroots is extremely, extremely important. So from the youngest age, really, all of these things need to be taught. The players need to be taught technically, right? The social side needs to be dealt with. The tactical side needs to be dealt with. Physical side needs to be dealt with. Psychological side needs to be dealt with. All the way through their development. You cannot just start at a particular point in their development. Quite often, if you do that, it's going to be too late. This has to be something that becomes second nature. So all that happens is that the older they get, there's, there's more intensity. It's the same thing in the training. You, you know, it, as you train as a, as a 10-year-old, when you get to 12, it is more intense. When you get to 15, it is more intense and all the way along the line. So in terms of the young, long player, long-term player development, these things really must be taught from a very young age. So, you know, coaches, when you're out there, you're not just a technical coach, because if you're just on a technical coach, you're doing these kids a disservice. You're not preparing them for, um, for life later on. So it's important that you teach them all of these aspects from a very young age. Now, um, within your book itself, it actually has got a step-by-step -step guide on, on how you can do this, how you can structure uh, coaching sessions, how you look at various aspects, psychological, physical, all that kind of stuff. Um, can you just go through your book so the guys can actually understand how it works and how they can implement it within their own uh, coaching platforms? Yeah, I mean, basically the, the, the book deals with um, a number of things. It, it deals really with the, the method of coaching and the method of coaching the different age groups. So, you know, you don't teach a five-year-old, but you teach an eight-year-old. So each age group has a, a method of coaching. What will help those kids to learn and grow? So within the manual, say for the five to seven age group, you will find a complete um, program there for them in terms for the coach as to how and what to coach. And also he would, he would find for his benefit, there is a 10 week program, a 10 week progressional program for him to follow um, with those kids. Now it is done in that fashion so that in the event, the coach has to be aware a particular week Someone who comes into his position for that week doesn't just come in and decide, look, I'm going to do shooting today. You know, he, he picks up the manual. It says week four. And there are all the topics in week four that has to be taught. So he picks up and does those topics to the kids. So the kids don't actually go over stuff they've done before or they've done stuff that is too advanced for them. The coach comes in and does the work for them. Now, the same thing happens in this seven to nine years group. There's 10 weeks there for the coach, obviously with different objectives because these guys, kids are a little bit older. And again, the same thing, the coach has, you know, somebody can come in, take up this program and run it for that week. Then the next age group, 9 to 11, again, there's a 10 week program there, a little bit more advanced um, than 11. 11 to 13, more advanced, and then adults. So the manual has method of coaching. It deals also with um, warm-ups, um, 
you know, passing and control for the different age groups, obviously, which is, again, totally different. You know, running with the ball it deals with, um, dribbling, turning, shooting, heading. Um, you know, within heading, it also, there is certain age groups where, you know, heading is not advised um, in, in training. So all of that is, is, is outlined there. But for those age groups where heading is, all, all the, it's all spelled up there for you. Um, defending, it deals with, with, with defending. Attacking, uh, these were small-sided games. Um, there, are, there are assessments and tests um, for the players. Um, and obviously, as I said, you know, there's working with the, 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 the age groups, tells you how to work with them. Um, there's also some practical coaching um, assessments. Um, so there are some assessments there for you to actually look at that, that you can use. The manual is written in such a way that it is not a manual that a coach just has to follow blindly. It is done in such a way that the coach's input is very, very important. While you are given the various topics to teach, it is incumbent on the coach now to research those topics and provide his drills specific to that, to that, to that um, objective and to that age group. So I want the coach to be engaged. I don't want him to just follow a book. So it is done in a way so that he has a role to play as well. And then one of the other things that it has, um, which is very, very important, is young, the young player evaluation. The young player evaluation really is something that is, you know, you must, you must always do with your players because if you don't do that with your players, you will never ever know what they're strong at, what, what they're weak at, what you need to work on, et cetera, et cetera. And within the young player um, evaluations, you know, you're looking at different things. You're looking at things like passing, control. So you're, you're, you're grading the kids on these things. You're grading them on passing, control, um, Dribbling, and this is the nine, this is seven to nine years we're using right now. Running with the ball, heading, shooting, psychological profile. Um, so, so those are sort of things that, that you're looking at. Now, again, when it goes to a higher age group, you're looking at those things, but there are different um, criteria in each of those. So, the, the, the player evaluation is extremely important um, for all coaches to do. Um, with their players because it, it provides a record that I can look at any one time at, at this and to say that um, Sean has a, a difficulty with, I'll use, I'll use an example here as a, as a said, an older player. Um, so if I am, if I am grading Sean uh, particularly on passing and I look in at accuracy over short or long distance passing um, Sean may be a one on that, then I know is I know for sure that that is an area that he needs to work on. Um, penetration of the pass, you know, might be might be three, so he's good at that. So he just maintains, he just has to maintain that. Um, vision, you know, he sees the field. Um, one, that is something we have to work on. So that's just an example. And if you go, so each of those. Um, headings, as I said, passing, control, dribbling, running with the, with the ball, heading, shooting, etc. Each of those having three or four different things um, that you test the player on and you, 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 know, you end up knowing what he's strong at, what he's weak at, what he needs to work at, what he needs to maintain. Um, that's all there in this manual. So it is a complete manual um, for coach who perhaps doesn't even have a lot of time to, to do things himself. Um, he can just use the manual for that purpose. There's a question here from Coach Mandler. Uh, Mandler is one of the guys I spoke to about from Sundowns who is huge in the development of players and finding players and travels all over the country, spends most of his year in his car traveling from place to place to watch football. And he says that uh, what are the real challenges in your current job 
and how do you deal with them without affecting your staff members? Right, the, 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 the problems um, associated with getting, getting to, these, to these young players is the coaches understanding of, what can I say? Right, Co coaches understanding what high performance is. That, 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 that is, that is um, very, very important. So um, some coaches have limited um, experience of high performance and therefore um, they, they, they see a player makes an assessment, but they don't really have the experience to, to, to understand that perhaps within that group, there's a player who hasn't shined quite as much, but has the attributes to develop into a far better player. So having that, that insight um, is, is, is extremely important for coaches to have. Um, I think, you know, also coaches must use um, other, I, I, I put it, other eyes. There must be more than your eyes. There must be more than two eyes. Um, you know, I, I'm also a, a selector in Barbados. I'm a, I'm a Barbados selector. And I select the national team, but I don't just rely on just my two eyes in relation to players. So what I do is I, I also get other coaches to assess or look at these players so that there are many eyes. Now, if six of us hone in on this same player, then I, I have a good idea that you know, we're going in the right direction. No, because it is possible that just me alone, I could make a, a right or wrong decision. So I think having more eyes um, assist you is very important. Well, it's, it's nearly 10 past six in your time. Thank you for getting up so early in the morning to come and chat to us. It's no, I mean, it's, exhausting. it's a great pleasure. And, um, as you know, I could talk for all, all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Really enjoyed that. And... If anybody wants to know more about the, the program, about um, um, what, what Papa Douglas is doing also here in South Africa for Roland and uh, uh, Roland's book, um, there is this form here that I've sent out a couple of times already. You can fill it in. We can get back to you. We can tell you about what they're doing. We can put you in contact with, with um, uh, Papa Douglas. And um, also you can buy the book. So um, thank you very, very much, Roland. And I hope uh, we all thoroughly enjoyed it and um, have a great day from here onwards. Yeah, Sean, it's, um, you know, it's a great pleasure um, speaking to you. I I'm really looking forward to, you know, to working with Papa Douglas on this because you know, I can see the similarities between the Caribbean and, 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 and South Africa. We have the same challenges and um, really, you know, the, the amount of talent that exists in these, these two areas, um, it is there. Um, there's no question about that. Um, your last speaker, you know, he, he, you know, he spoke about, you know, the cultural mentality um, that holds us back. And really, you know, working with Papa, you know, and looking to try and develop um, within um, the, the, the South African youth um, that desire um, to want to go further, um, to get out of. Um, what is the cultural norm? I really looked, as your last speaker said, you know, you, you've got to reach for, the, reach for the stars and you might reach the sky. Um, so I'm looking forward to this, to, the, to really working, um, getting this methodology out there. And, and I'm sure that certainly at grassroots level, um, get that right and then it will filter all the way up. So yeah, it's a great pleasure. Um, it's early morning here in Barbados. So there's no point in going back to bed. There's a test match on in England. So that's from here. That's where I'm going now for the next four or five hours um, to tune into that test match. But Sean, it's been a great pleasure. And um, thank you very much for inviting me.